right, everybody, welcome to our OpenShift Commons AMA, Ask Them Anything, Not Me, um, for Knative. And today we have uh, Paul Morey, Matt Moore, Scott Nichols, and Roland Huss, um, all participants in this wonderful project, who are going to give us an introduction, tell us a little bit about the roadmap, and hopefully leave a little bit of time at the end for all of your questions. So um, we are live streaming this, so if you are in any one of the multiple live streams, like Facebook, YouTube or Twitch, or I think Periscope even now, throw your questions in that and we will aggregate them here and force these people to answer them. So without any further ado, Paul, introduce yourself and your cohorts and let's um, find out what's going on in Knative land. All right, well, uh, I'm Paul Mori, everybody, uh, and I work on Knative at Red Hat. And why don't we just have everybody introduce themselves uh, so you can be sure that you're satisfied with your introduction. And if you're not satisfied, you have only yourself to blame. Matt, why don't you go ahead next? Sure. Hi, hey, I'm, I'm Matt Moore. I uh, work at VMware. I'm one of the folks who um, started Knative now a little over three years ago uh, at Google, and I've been doing container tooling stuff for uh, what feels like forever. Nice to meet a lot of you. Uh, I'm going to toss the hot potato to Roland. Yeah, hello. My name is Roland Hus. I'm working on Knative, I think, now for two years. And I'm mostly involved in the, in the Knative client project. And uh, I'm there, the working group lead. And yeah, I'm doing all the things client here. Yeah, that's me. Now, Scott, up to you. Hey, howdy. I'm uh, Scott Nichols. I work on Knative at Red Hat, formerly Google. Uh, I, I work on the eventing side, mostly focused around source creation so that's that's how events get into the cluster and make uh in interesting things that uh you can do with events and uh, i also contribute to the cloud events cncf project scott if i can just correct you i'm it's news to me if you work at red hat i think you meant to say vmware i thought i said well <laughs> oh, yeah. Not, right. Okay, well, yes, sorry, Red Hat. What? No, VMware. Woof. <laughs> Roland's freaking me out. Oh, you know what it is? It's this Red Hat logo down at the bottom here. Anyway, moving on. More show. Moving on. K we, all work, we all work together. What is it? Paul, your camera's, right. not, camera, you're not, your camera's not on, Paul, so we're not seeing your smiling face. So You want to see my face? We'd love to see your face. Hey there. there it's me. Go. All right. Um, uh, yeah, I guess I'll just hold this if you want to see my face. Um, so, what is it? Uh, one of the one of the things that uh, that is sort of in the in the air in our industry is a confusion between two related but different things, um, and those two things are serverless and FAS or functions as a service, uh, and I've, I've seen Knative referred to as a FAS a few times. It's really not. Uh, and here's how I would put the difference between the two. Um, and uh, any of my, uh, my co-presenters, feel free to riff on me or uh, correct me if I'm wrong or whatever. But I would articulate uh, serverless as being essentially uh, request-driven and uh, automatic scale to zero as being two identifying uh, and key properties. So uh, when we think about what FAS is, it's usually a lot more than serverless. I think uh, to me personally, my own opinion, uh, FAS implies serverless, but serverless doesn't necessarily imply FAS. So um, when we talk about Knative, we're gonna be focused on uh, serverless elements uh, and we're not going to be focused as much on those experiential elements that are the difference to me personally between serverless and FAS, where FAS is something more than serverless. It's got a lot of uh, connotations of developer experience, builds, uh, and SDLC bound up into it um, that are more than just serverless. So let's talk a little bit more uh, as I'm double fisting uh, these uh, these devices since I've got my phone and, and my laptop. I'll see if I can operate them both correctly. 
Um, what is Knative really? Now that we've kind of uh, maybe close to hit bedrock with maybe if we were thinking it was a FAS, we're sort of recognizing that it's not exactly FAS and it's more serverless. Um, Knative is really a Kubernetes extension that is focused on developer productivity. So when we talk about extending Kubernetes, uh, I'm sure this will be uh, familiar to a lot of people in this audience that um, Kubernetes extension looks like a Kubernetes-like API, so declarative API surface, uh, usually implemented with CRDs, and that is what we use in Knative Project is uh, CRDs and the uh, accompanying features of Cube like webhooks for conversion, uh, for validation, for mutation, uh, that provide a Kubernetes-like API and API experience without um, without adding code into Cube. So uh, we're extending Kubernetes to solve these boring but hard problems, like scaling to and from zero and scaling on demand based on requests, uh, and uh, having a history of revisions for our application and routing events and stuff like that. So things that, uh, Boring is really not uh, is is not being overly generous. We're maybe uh, being facetious when we say boring but hard, but maybe things that you would repeat over and over again. I've certainly implemented uh, some of these things myself in previous lives uh, before Kubernetes. So things that you might find yourself implementing over and over again. They're tough. They're hard to get right. They take uh, they take a lot of engineering. Know how to get exactly right and. Uh, in my own personal impression, that's sort of the value proposition of Knative is that we're doing a lot of these things that you would have to worry about yourself because Kubernetes doesn't already do them uh, and giving you the tools to kind of really just focus on your business logic and what you want your application or the system that you're building to do. So there's two key pieces here and actually this, this is an outdated slide and Roland, I'm just gonna apologize to you and the folks that work on the client uh, because I've left off the client, but the two key functional pieces that we're gonna talk about today, and we're also gonna talk about the client, um, are serving, which is about the uh, like scale to and from zero, scale up to N on demand, history of immutable application revisions that we can split traffic between uh, for any number of different reasons that we wanna do that and uh, eventing, which is about connecting in a loosely coupled and late binding way, event producers and consumers. Uh, I don't wanna say too much more about either of these uh, to, so that I don't steal the uh, very impressive bolts of thunder that my co-presenters have for us today, but that's, uh, those will be two of the main focuses and then we're also gonna hear about the client uh, and that's, that is, uh, those are the high notes. So uh, co-presenters, do you wanna just add anything here before we move on? Or is that sufficient for you? I think you nailed it, Paul. Yeah. Nailed totally. it. 2021, off to a good start. Nailed one thing already. Let's move on to a little history lesson. So uh, Matt, why don't, you, why don't you do the first couple bullets here? Because Matt is, uh, is one of the founders of Knative Project. Sure. Uh, so uh, this is this is uh, you know there's always a lot going on, but this is sort of a, a highlight reel of some of the sort of major events throughout the course of the project. So um, back in sort of fall of 2017, um, we we started some of the really early prototyping of you know what Paul described, trying to sort of uh, look at what higher le level uh, abstraction on top of Kubernetes uh, for you know developer productivity, serverless, fast, style thing uh, would look like. Um, it launched publicly, you know, we, we, you know, tons of folks joined in, Red Hat joined in, Pivotal joined in, um, you know, lots and lots of folks were, were discussing it and it uh, launched publicly in July of 2018. Um, and a lot's happened since then. So. Uh, at the time, we also had another area called Knative Build, um, which was intended to help solve the sort of source-oriented nature that people sort of 
traditionally think of as being a key part of sort of fast workloads. Um, and uh, in March of 2019, that, that spun out as its own project, uh, which you may know now as Tecton. Um, so, uh, you know, other ma major milestones, the Serving API uh, had their V1 revision uh, in September of 2019. Um, and one of the one of the big things that's been sort of a recurring theme laced through some of the more technically oriented things in here has been the topic of sort of governance. Um, and Paul's been, you know, uh, one of the one of the big advocates of this on steering. Um, and uh, in uh, May of last year, we had our first TOC elections. Um, and uh, Marcus, Mia, and Grant joined the TOC, and we now have a sort of um, vendor neutral representation. No one company has um, more than two of the five seats on um, the technical oversight committee, which is a really interesting milestone in the sort of open aspects of Knative as a project. Um, shortly thereafter, in, in summer of uh, uh, 2020, uh, the eventing API went V1. Uh, and uh, in November of, uh, going to say this year, uh, this past year, uh, we had uh, our first steering elections where Paul uh, won one of the elected seats and um, and uh, Vila Aikis, who is one of the other folks who started the project uh, a few years ago, um, won one of, uh, won the other elected seat. So we now have um, uh, both a steering committee and a, a technical oversight committee where no one, no single vendor, you know, uh, has all the say, right? Um, so uh, it's very exciting times for the project. Yeah, one thing that I'll just add uh, is that when Matt talks about the technical oversight committee and steering committee is that um, in addition to the vendor neutrality element that Matt described, the folks on those committees are serving as individuals, not as employees of their vendors. So in, this, in the sense that um, uh, it's vendor neutral in the sense that like you, we can't have more than two people employed by the same vendor, those folks that are in the committees are not acting on behalf of their vendor, they're serving as individuals, which I think is an important point to mention. Um, thanks, yeah, but, thanks for the, the history lesson, Matt. Uh, anybody else want to get? Oh, critical sorry, go detail ahead. That I'm already taking yes. for granted. <laughs> yes. Um, anybody else, uh, any of my co-presenters want to add anything to this slide? Excellent. Okay. All right. So we got the first meme of this presentation, cloud events. Um, I had a couple different variations of this meme. One of them is the one that you see. The other one said cloud events. I wanted to put Scotty's face on it, but I didn't have enough time. Uh, and I think uh, Dan Pop generously offered to do it, and then I forgot about it. So this is what you get. We'll maybe make one that's even more funny, but wanted to say a few words about cloud events. Um, I'm not sure how uh, high the name recognition is for the cloud events project, but the cloud event format is a uh, vendor independent standard for event metadata that, um, that is actually a CNCF project. Um, Scott in particular, I think from the group of co-presenters that I had today is very active in the cloud events space. So Scott, you might wanna add, uh, add stuff to, to what I say after I'm done. But um, the reason that I mentioned cloud events is that when we talk about things being event activated and event driven, driven in Knative, and uh, you know, in particular, eventing, uh, there's probably a fairly obvious connection there with eventing. Uh, the message format that is the lingua franca of uh, Knative project is the cloud event format, uh, and it is uh, supposed to facilitate interoperability between different producers and consumers. Um, be a vendor neutral format that can be adopted and it's what we what we're using as an event format in in, uh, in Knative. Scott, do you want to add anything to that? Anything important that we should know before we we continue our journey through this introduction to Knative? 
Yeah, I, I think the, the only missing important bit about cloud events is that the specification describes how to turn the that the core nugget of your event between protocols and back to this uh, protocolless version of that event. And so the reason this is important is I can go and write my FAS, have it based on cloud events, and then all of a sudden I'm not locked into the protocol I choose if, uh, when the project started. So uh, Knative serving is really about, you know, adding this missing layer to Kubernetes to make, you know, functions or containers scale easily. Eventing is really about uh, kind of choose your protocol of how you do transport later because uh, we help turn these events from these cloud events into other protocols. So you could uh, be running in Kafka in production, but uh, maybe NATS on your desktop because it's a lighter weight to run or something like that, uh, or even pure HTTP. So uh, we get a we get away with this because we depend on cloud events to be this kind of like neutral converter between these protocol specific eventing formats and this conical form. All right. Well, uh, let's talk about. Uh, let's t do a little bit more in depth on serving so we can learn a little bit more about how that scaling works. Um, Matt, I think this is your slide. What does Knative serving get me? Sure. So, um, so I think you framed this well at the beginning, right? Talking about a lot of the stuff you have to do um, in terms of sort of uh, you know, there's a lot involved to launch a production uh, service on top of Kubernetes, and a lot of you know, I'd um, I'd use the word boilerplate in terms of the the kinds of things you need to set up to sort of operate um, a service, right? You you have deployments, you have services, you have ingresses, you have HPAs, you have all of these things, right? That um, you you know you need to do when you're adding new services, and as folks shift from sort of uh, you know big monolithic applications to, you know, the new hotness, microservices or even functions, right? You end up you, you end up needing to do that a lot more, right? And so the way I like to think about serving is um, sort of reducing the incremental complexity of launching new services um, and, you know, having this goal of enabling developers to effectively focus on, you know, the business value they want to provide in those services, right? So Really, with Knative Serving, what you bring is just a container image that has your HTTP-based application in it. Um, and what you get is um, you get a DNS endpoint for your application, uh, possibly exposed externally. Um, you know, we if you've configured automatic TLS, these will be TLS terminated endpoints without you ha developers having to do uh, anything. Uh, as Paul mentioned earlier, as you, um, you know, uh, create changes in your application, um, each, each version of your application is stamped out as what we call a revision over time. The, the next slide sort of illustrates this a little bit, but what makes this a powerful concept is um, it enables you to reason about um, sort of versions of your application over time. Um, and this is most useful when you want to say Canary sending some traffic to a new version of your application uh, or all of the uh, traffic to a new version and roll forwards and backwards in time uh, depending on your production needs. You go back for just one second. I just want to make sure I, yeah, okay. And uh, I think the two other really interesting things are request-based auto scaling. So. Um, as your application uh, gets more or less traffic, and this may be because you were rolling out a new version or not, um, the uh, we will basically right size your application and you know have 10 replicas, 20 replicas, or even zero replicas, depending on sort of the volume of traffic your application is serving. Um, the last thing that we do that I think is really interesting to call out, um, at, and this is to enable those sort of fast style use cases are what folks think of when they they think of fast right with with your lambdas or your uh, google cloud functions or your whatnot a lot of these fast models have this ability to have the the sort of runtime layer take care of um 
concurrency control. And so if I wanna say only let one request through to each instance of my application at a time, uh, you can do that through this idea of container concurrency. And it's one of those things that we have built so that your application doesn't need to deal with, you know, concurrency control, which can be tough to get right. Um, especially when you start to blend it with things like load balancing and auto scaling and getting really good performance out of some of those things. Um, so, uh, so yeah, so the next slide um, really illustrates the resource model here. So I mentioned the sort of one resource um, that you need to deal with for launching new services. This is the service resource. In its simplest form, you pretty much just give it a container. Um, this exposes an HTTP endpoint. Uh, under the hood, it creates a uh, what we call a configuration resource, um, which tracks the sort of latest state of configuration for, uh, you know, uh, what what is running, and those revisions are that history of changes to that configuration resource. I, I like to make the analogy of revisions are sort of like Git commits, and configurations are sort of like the floating head of uh, your Git branch. And so, you know, as you make changes to your branch, new commits happen, but the old commits are always there. And so you, um, you can always sort of reference those older commits uh, if you need to. And so the route is uh, what controls where traffic is sent over that history of configuration, uh, of revisions. And so you can either have us automatically track the latest, or you can, you know, uh, if you want to sort of take com complete control, you can, uh, you know, control percentage-based rollouts, or, you know, to distribute traffic across some number of revisions, um, and you know, do one percent, two percent. You can even do zero percent splits and um, do what we call tagging. Um, if you wanted to sort of pin but qualify a new revision prior to sending it any of your sort of main traffic load. So you can do some very powerful and uh, sophisticated, uh, you know, canarying and qualification prior to rolling things out. But the configuration to do these things is ends up being typically quite, quite small. And so we take a lot of the complexity out of some of these things that, you know, can get very, very complicated. Um, so next slide. I think it's our next meme, if I'm not mistaken. Okay, yes. So this is this is my favorite um, bit of uh, a native FUD, right? So when we first launched, this was actually um, true. Uh, we did actually need Istio, but one of the pieces of feedback we got pretty quickly was that um, uh, you know there are other networking layers out there. You know, some folks don't want sort of the full mesh style networking layer. Some you know just want to deal with uh, you know, ingress style networking. And so um, one of the things that we did was we built an abstraction between sort of sort of describing what uh, we need from the networking layer where, you know, Kubernetes ingress wasn't quite cutting it. And I think everyone has sort of accepted that um, Kubernetes ingress V, you know, now V1, it was V1 beta one at the, well, at the time and for what well, seems like forever. Um, but uh, so we, we built an abstraction that, you know, um, let us describe sort of our needs from the networking layer. And this became one of those options, but we have now half a dozen or so integrations like Courier and Contour and Glue and Kong and uh, Ambassador. Um, and these are all in our sort of install uh, instructions. And, and frankly, I, you know, I, I'm partial to, to Contour, but like I haven't run Istio in, uh, I think over a year for most of my Knative development. And, you know, it really, it's just an implementation detail and you can choose any of those options. And a lot of them are actually, you know, really great. And I think, you know, comparable to Istio, which is our oldest uh, integration. So, um, so yes, we do not need Istio. Uh, Istio is just one way of running Knative. Do you want to add anything to that, Paul? You know, the the thing that I wanted to add before we uh, move on is just that, uh, and I, uh, I don't think we touched on this, but it's important. Um, the, the service API uh, and configuration APIs are subsets of the pod spec. Uh, and so when we see the demo uh, later in our talk, um, let's, let's just make, make sure that we uh, highlight that so that people can see it in action. Um, the reason I mention it is because uh, I, I suspect that a lot of 
um, a lot of deployments that people have today would translate directly into services if folks wanted to try that out and see how uh, their existing deployments work in an event-driven mode where they're scaled down and back up depending on load. Uh, but otherwise, I think you covered it very thoroughly. And I will just uh, go ahead and advance the slide now to the roadmap. Okay, so this is um, this is a sort of taste of some of the things we're working on. Excuse me, sorry, I had a tickle in my throat. Um, so see, these are some of the things that we have sort of um, cooking in various uh, stages of development. Um, one of them is domain mapping, the idea of being able to assign sort of a vanity URL to your Knative services so you don't have that foo.bar.example.com, you can have like, uh, you know, my awesome blog.mapmore.io and, uh, you know, assign, you know, uh, proper DNS names with uh, now TLS termination uh, in front of your Knative services. So uh, this is an alpha. I believe it's available in our .19 and our .20 releases, which .20 is not off the presses. .20 added auto TLS to it. This is an alpha API. Um, uh, so if folks want to give feedback on this, uh, we would greatly appreciate it. It is magic, by the way. It's it's the, one of the coolest features that Knative has shipped in a long time. I am so excited about it. Um, it Basically, what it results in is TLS terminated uh, pet project domains across your cluster. It's amazing. Yes, finally something to do with all those domains you've been buying. Um, so one of the other really cool things that uh, I like that's been, um, this has been in the works for uh, a few releases now, um, is this idea of gradual rollout. So we, we support very fine-grained traffic control where you can you know take revisions directly and split across them with pretty fine grain. But um, one of the most common modes we see folks doing, and this is, you know, when you're getting started, you sort of just want to roll out to the latest all of the time. Um, but depending on how much traffic you're getting, if we just shift things over in one big swoop, um, you know, our ability to scale from zero to, you know, huge number might be, uh, you know, limited by factors at the Kubernetes layer. And so, um, uh, what the gradual rollout project is doing is basically making it smarter about sort of being able to shift traffic uh, to that over some amount of time that you have specified. And um, that way, you know, as you start to scale up to bigger, um, uh, you know, deployments, you can, uh, you know, not drop traffic as you're rolling out uh, new versions without needing to, you know, do your, your own whole complex uh, orchestration. Um, one of the one of the last things I, I wanted to touch on, you know, I mentioned that that networking layer that we created as our own abstraction because Ingress uh, v1 wasn't quite good enough. Um, we've been engaging with the Ingress v2 efforts in upstream Kubernetes to make sure that when that lands, <coughs> excuse me, um, when that lands, um, it does meet our needs, and we can retire that abstraction and leverage, you know, just raw Kubernetes to do a lot of you know, what we want. And then two aspects that we will be sort of pushing on forever are scaling in every dimension you can imagine, as well as uh, request latency. So I will hand things, I think, back over to Paul. I think that's my Yeah, own. we've got a we got a couple questions about uh, serving in the chat here. The first one is from Dan. Um, can this integrate with Helm for deploying Helm charts, rolling back charts, or does it replace it? Uh, so, um, so I just want to make sure I understand. So, I think the question is, can I use Helm to roll out uh, Knative services? Is that the gist of it? I I kind of had a different reading of that, but I think okay. I think the question that you that that you read out of it is an important one to answer. Uh, Sorry, can you so guys hear me? Take okay. that one first. Yes, go ahead. So yeah, I mean the the um, that that is an alternative reading, and that's that's fine. I'd like an answer to that as well. Um, but it was more. I saw you talking about the way that um, the you, you can you've got this idea of a canary, a, a rollout, and a rollback, and I kind of we, we've been 
expecting to use Helm to do that, and I'm just wondering, is this an alternative, or because um, we've committed quite a bit to to model our applications to be deployed as Helm charts, and I just wonder, does does this integrate with it, or does this replace it uh, as a as a mechanism for rolling and upgrading between versions of services? So uh, uh, that's that's a good question. Um, so. I don't think we do anything specifically to integrate Helm sort of more deeply than what you can do with Helm in our YAML. And you should be able to use uh, Knative, uh, sorry, uh, Helm to roll out Knative services in much the way you can roll out, you know, um, other resources. Um, but I think uh, we haven't done anything to sort of integrate with Helm more deeply with respect to, you know, awareness of its revision model. Um, and But there's, I think in principle, nothing uh, stopping you from leveraging Helm to manipulate Knative, um, uh, you know, Knative's concept of traffic control. So one of the things we did uh, introduce is um, we have this more sort of sophisticated way of, um, sort of doing fine-grained control where you can, rather than just having us generate names for each new revision, you can bring your own name for the revisions, which allows you to sort of predictably stamp out new names for revisions, um, which you can then use in traffic control. And so that allows you to do, um, I, I think it allows you to do more like what you were describing, but there's no deep integration if that's the question. And so would, would you expect to deploy different revisions to different namespaces, or would multiple revisions be deployed to the same namespace, typically, as a best practice kind of thing? Uh, so today, uh, today all revisions need to live in the same namespace, and most of the resource model within serving expects things to live within, um, you know, a single namespace. And it, to some extent, it's designed so that if you, if, if you were, uh, leveraging namespace as your, as your tendency model, you should be able to hand users credentials to manipulate Knative serving resources within that namespace, and they should be able to operate productively, if that makes sense. Okay, great, thanks for your time. Uh, there's one other question uh, that I'll call out for now. It's not the only question in there, but it's the one that's closest to serving. Uh, and the question is, uh, will, let's see, when is there an ETA on functions coming coming to Knative? Uh, and I would say at this point there really is not an ETA that we can give. Um, we had uh, at, like in our community we had um, maybe uh, a couple times the subject has come up, uh, but we so far haven't. Um, and I think there's a very great interest in having a concept of functions. Uh, that is uh, that that is on top of Knative that's community based, um, but we so far haven't been able to agree. I don't think on an approach, so I can't really give an ETA now. It's definitely on our radar, um, and I appreciate you know the the question being asked. Um, I think I think what would uh, what would be great from the uh, if the 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 person who asked the question is very interested in it. I'd love to get a note about that to the Knative dev uh, or Knative users mailing list. Uh, they're, they're Knative-dev and Knative-users, uh, and it's uh, homed in Google Groups. I'd love to get some uh, surfacing of that in there. I've def I will definitely surface that it came up, uh, but so far we, we can't really give an ETA on it. Um, and I think in the interest of time, it's probably best to advance the slide now, and I think that will be uh, a venting. So, uh, Scott, why don't, you, uh, why don't you take this section as the, uh, the eventing rep on our little call? Thanks, Paul. Okay, so uh, what does a Knative eventing get me? It's a good question. I can read the slides here. So. Um, we're, we're enabling async app development through event-driven from anywhere, loosely coupled and late bind uh, producers and consumers. Uh, producers generate events before uh, consumers exist. 
things. So basically, uh, eventing has a hard problem because there's you know 20, 30 years of eventing history in compute, right? Like serverless is fairly new, and there's no real like cookbook patterns of how you cook up a serverless containerized thingy. But eventing patterns and messaging patterns have been around forever. So we we kind of got to step back and say, what does this look like in Kubernetes land? And the answer is uh, something that uh, is late bound. So you, you have a reconcile loop that's constantly healing your consumers and producers and repointing them at, uh, you know, new my consumer moves uh, to a new cluster URL or a new cluster or resolves to a new address or gets deleted and recreated somewhere else. And that being able to heal the clusters of venting mesh is something that we really focused on around in eventing. Uh, one thing the slides don't really say is eventing's really broken up into a few different big major chunks. We started out with messaging. We have a messaging API group and it kind of, uh, it it puts a thin abstraction on top of uh, like pub sub components. Turns out that's really hard to build with because uh, it's very imperative on how you would assemble your uh, your cluster. So uh, we came up with a second model that sits on top of that, that, that can leverage it, but it doesn't have to, we, uh, we call eventing. And eventing is more like, uh, actually, can we go to the next slide? Can we kind of show? Uh, so we uh, venting brought in this thing called the broker. You can think of this as like the the ecosystem of or uh, the the mesh of all the events that are flowing through your eventing system. And you pluck events out of that mesh using a trigger. Trigger points to a broker, has a filter. You could consider it like a query. Once that query matches, that that event gets uh, copied out of the broker and delivered to a subscriber. And uh, we have a bunch of magic here to let this be discoverable and late bound and um, self healing and things like that. Now, one one thing that I'll just mention here is that the the targetable doesn't have to be a K native service, right, Scott? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So the uh, as we were developing of eventing components, we we kind of had this idea, uh, I think uh, Vile and I were talking to Matt and we hit upon this idea that, well, potentially Knative serving, we don't, we don't want those components to be coupled, right? So uh, eventing knows nothing about serving. It's independent, but they do share some common interfaces that we call duct types, but basically, um, the, the trigger can point to uh, this duct type that we call addressable, which basically says in your status, you have this place that you'll expose your URL you would like to be uh, invoked on, right? So anything, any CRD could actually implement this. And uh, a lot of the eventing components implement this contract. Serving implements this contract. You could write a CRD that implements this contract and have it just kind of wire up and play or uh, the trigger takes a URL too, which could be in cluster or ex uh, external to the cluster. So yeah, um, this event, Knative eventing is completely decoupled from serving, but it works really well with serving. All right, ready to move on to the roadmap slide? Sure. All right. So Aventing's roadmap, we're um, we're working on stabilization. There's a lot of features that uh, they work, but they could use more tests, and those tests could be a little more uh, stable. So we're really uh, focusing on that right now. We've got several experimental features that uh, there's a link, but it's there's a bunch of experiments. So because Aventing's been around and serving, or sorry, eventing and messaging have been around so long, there's a lot of ideas around uh, what we, where should we go and what should we do. Eventing doesn't really want to have to take an opinion there. It's, we're trying to enable all of the A star patterns that you could invent and, and implement uh, using this thing. So where serving brings you really easy Kubernetes scale to zero containers, Eventing 
enables this uh, really easy shim on top of other protocols to help you decouple your choices so that you could make different choices later without having to re recreate your entire uh, application, right? Uh, but that, uh, that, that thin shim needs some more features like maybe some smarter filtering in the triggers or um, improving the, the reply contract. So like, uh, how do I know uh, in the data plane that if I'm going to invoke some subscriber, how does that uh, subscriber understand that it can reply to the broker to re-ingress an event back in? So uh, why would you want to do that? Well, we had this interesting thought. What if the broker allowed you to reply to events and then those new events that uh, you're replied with gets ingressed back into the broker so you never have to know which broker invoked you, right? So um, smaller footprint, smaller, uh, more reuse of your deployed components, things like this. Uh, we are right. in eventing. Oh. Sorry, I thought you were done. Go ahead. So then in the next six months, we're still catching up on the uh, auto scaling of the eventing components. Still working on that. We're partnering with uh, projects like Kata to, to look at, well, pull-based scale models maybe Kata is the, the way. And so like, well, we're, we're adding hooks and uh, plug points and some standards on how you get your eventing components to scale with external things like Kata. Uh, we're looking at, well, so, you know, we make kube events to understand what's going on. And we make these cloud events that are in the data plane that uh, your application is making. But uh, we're kind of looking at, well, maybe there's this, uh, third category kind of in the middle of what would my application say if it could make events and then how would I route those things and react to it? So event model, event driven models for your application and all of the components that enable your application is this. And uh, k-native eventing is, it's, it's kind of an implementation of the cloud events specification with a bunch of other opinions. One of the things that we're working on in cloud events is uh, the discovery and subscription APIs. And I think you're gonna see that trickle down into Knative uh, in the next six months or so. All right, well, thank you, Scott. Uh, Roland, you're up. Why don't you tell us about that Fly CLI? Yeah, sure. Yeah, uh, the CLI actually. This is a, a, a com component which uh, opens you with the door to Canadian Wonderland. So if you go to the next slide, please. It's it's really about how you can access Canadian from your CLI. Actually, of course you can everything you can do everything with your source files as well. But actually, a, C a dedicated CLI for Canadian has some advantages. So you can distinguish between two mode of a run So one is the iterative mode, so that as you know from cube control as well, and you can actually manage nearly, I think all of the native core entities, which are user facing directly with CRUD operations. So you can create them, you can make updates and of course list them in very details in a human consumable format. And of course you can delete them as well. So that you can group them also into different areas like we have, for Canadian serving, we, we know how to manage services. We can create manage Canadian uh, services and also revisions. Um, and uh, also for eventing, we have different, yeah. For every entity, you have a kind of a noun. So it's a, always the same schema. So you have a KN, then you have uh, the, the noun and then the verb, what you want to do. Um, for the sources, actually, this is also a very important eventing component, which is kind of an adapter, for which main purpose is more or less to convert uh, custom or events from, from outside into a cloud event format, and which are kind of feed into the eventing infrastructure. So for that, we have also direct support for all the sources, which already come directly built in with creative, ser creative eventing, sorry. But we can also manage other sources, which we can leverage by using plugins. 
But beside this imperative management, which is very nice if you want to build up your services incrementally, it's like you say you're in the CLI, you want to add something, you want to try out something, and then finally you can also export all the stuff that you have done from the cluster into a file. Uh, and then actually also just take this file to another cluster and import it there or, or, or create it like the script controller also with KN. But there's also this called so-called declarative handling of KF services, which allows you really to describe your target state that you want to have. And uh, this has the same semantics like cube control apply, which means you have a get a three-way merge with the stuff which happens in the meantime between two runs of apply, for example. So it, uh, it uh, <coughs> includes the same way, and actually it, it even reuses the way how cube control does this merging. And uh, also borrowed from the cube control architecture is the plugin, are the plugins that are similar to cube control. There's one thing which is, um, I think, which is in addition to the way how cube control handles plugins. So plugins in cube control are just external programs which are executed by by, ex uh, yeah, by executing it um, from from um, like like a direct like a comment. So it's a, it's a, a separated process for that. But you can also create uh, inline plugins, so, which means if your plugin is written in Golang, um, then you could also make an, a separate own, own build of your of KN and then inline that. So this is quite quite nice if you want to have kind of a um, single binary which includes a certain amount of, of plugins. And we are currently working also on a cube on a KN builder project, which allows you to declare the plugins that you want to include. And then just run that, and you get just one blob of binary that you can execute with all the plugins included. This, of course, only works for, for GoLang, uh, but the, the regular plugin architecture works for any language, of course. Then we also added recently uh, GitOps support, as we call it, which means we have dedicated Tecton tasks that you can reuse in your Tecton pipelines for uh, deploying your native services and a brand new fresh from the press is uh, an offline generation of resource files. So you can actually operate KN uh, against your local file system. So you don't, do not need to have a direct connection to your cluster, but you just add an option minus minus target. Uh, you provide a directory or a file name, and then it just creates the resource files directly from the arguments that you provide to KN. So this is a very easy way how you, even if you do not um, have a cluster at hand, but you also do not remember the schema of the Knative services, uh, uh, of the Knative resources, then you can just reuse KN, use the help messages, and then just use some arguments, and this will build up for you the YAML files. This is very, very convenient. And then, of course, you can take that file, commit it into your source control management system, and uh, go, uh, go ahead. So this is very, very nice. So we just have the support for KN service create, but actually we are also continuing this uh, theme by adding it to update and to yeah and to list and, and so on so it really this is really a very nice feature which i'm pretty excited about yeah this is a nutshell is what can can do for you so actually it's really you can everything you can do with resource file available but it's much much more convenient in, in my opinion that you can use kn on, on the command line you can install it easily with brew if you're on mac on s or on linux you have also brew for linux uh, support you can download it from the GitHub release pages, and they are released in the same cadence like the rest of Knative, so in the six weeks cadence for, for releasing all the Knative components. And because I just saw the question whether Knative CLI is uh, stable, I can say that it's pretty stable. It's a little bit, uh, for KN, it's a little bit different because it supports eventing and serving. And so, for example, as there was some point in time where serving was stable, but eventing was not. And in this uh, period, we had support for for both of them, but we marked, of course, the eventing support kind of experimental. We also have uh, other features which are marked experimental, but otherwise KN is uh, totally stable. It's included also in products like an OpenShift. It's already shipped with that, and uh, you completely rely on that. Yeah. That's uh, All right. KN in oh, a nutshell. Yeah, go ahead. <clears throat> yeah, I was going to say, let's hear about the roadmap. And there's a, yeah. there's a question that pertains to this that I'll that I'll give you once uh, once you go through this stuff. Okay, cool. Yeah, uh, what are the roadmaps? Actually, for the near future, we of course want to continue on the, all the topics that we have, have started. Uh, 
we want to support more sources and we also want to support arbitrary sources so sources that are not known when kn was compiled or built and we want to leverage uh, metadata that are offered to us so like crds but also the the Canadian discovery api uh, which is easier to consume for us because crds are a little bit hidden and uh, typically only meant for administrators so a regular user is not necessarily able to read CRDs. And uh, based on this meta information, we want to support uh, different command line arguments. So we really want to offer dynamically command line arguments that are based on the type that you are managing. So this is kind of quite challenging, but actually I bet this will give you a nice user experience, I'm you know, pretty sure. Then another thing which I'm, I'm very excited about, um, kind of uh, so called, uh, called Camelot, sorry. <laughs> So if you don't know Camelot, um, then no problem because this is really brand new technology. It's based on Camel, which is um, also uh, it's an, which is an enterprise application integration platform. And the good thing about this, so uh, about Apache Camel, is that it comes with around 300 plus components that you can reuse as Canadian sources, which means they can connect to external systems. And even if you don't know now, if you don't know nothing about Apache Camel, uh, using Camelot you can leverage all this existing stuff directly and just use it as kind of source, for example, to connect to systems like Telegram, Salesforce, ServiceNow, whatever you want to. And uh, Camelots will convert all these events to cloud events. And yeah, so support for that is um, will be implemented as kind of plugins as well. And then, uh, of course, we always are looking for new plugins in the Canadian Sandbox. Uh, so Canadian Sandbox is kind of a melting pot or something extension which are not really part of the Kinev core directly so it's really uh, something where we also put uh, different Kinev plugins into and two of them will be a lock, a lock plugin which allows you directly to print out service logs like you know from Stern for example but also another plugin like um, directly creating events locally on the command line and injecting it into the eventing infrastructure which is very convenient for testing and debugging. And finally, and we are always trying to improve here is uh, user experience. So, but we also uh, rely on your feedback for that. So actually we have, we know some weak points in the user experience, for example, the way how we can specify traffic splits, which you can definitely do with KN, but uh, I, we feel this can be better. And yeah, so we are going to improve on this story. And uh, yeah, so. This is the roadmap which you, which we will work on in the next six months, I would say. <clears throat> All right, thank you very much. It, you know, listening to this stuff um, that we're all talking about in this presentation, I'm like, this sounds pretty cool, but will it blend? So Scott, I believe you got a demo you're gonna show us to establish whether or not it will blend. Here's where I will uh, I will shut down the screen sharing, and Scott, go ahead and you can share your screen, and we'll come back to this deck in a moment. Okay, here we go. Uh, you need to turn it off. There we go. All right, I only got a few minutes, so uh, you know I'll just use this brick and extra effort. Cool. Okay, here we go. So I've been talking to my friends over at Falco. If you don't know what Falco is, it's a, a thing that watches this events that are interesting and turns them into web hooks. There's this other project called Falco Sidekick, which turns those events into some other thing. And I was like, well, you guys don't really have a uh, lot events there. And so I helped them add it. And here's a demo of using Falco and, and sidekick to do some stuff. So, kubectl. So, let's see. Uh, first off, let's take a look at the graph here. So, in my cluster right now, I have a sync binding that, that links the Falco sidekick into the ingress of the broker. So remember the broker only consumes cloud events, so cloud events are gonna bounce around in there. And then I have this trigger to uh, send 
anything that's from falco.org with the type uh, falco rule output to this sockeye service. So what the heck is sockeye? It's another fish program I wrote. Uh, it just shows you the stream of cloud events that are invoked using a WebSocket between the cluster in this web browser. So what can we do? We can, uh, let me let me just grab this little exec here. So I'm gonna exec into uh, my SQL pod that I have running. You can see it right here. So I'm gonna exec into it. Uh, I, I'm gonna do an interactive terminal. Cool, I've got one. And I also got this uh, event here that says, uh, terminal in shell. That's That seems like an interesting event. Uh, I don't really want people to have interactive shells on my, my cluster here. So, so I made um, a very, very, very simple application. Uh, all it does is it listens for a cloud event and it it does a kubectl delete on the pod that comes in, right? Very simple. And to implement that, uh, I get some RBAC to allow me to get and delete pods. I wrote a Knative trigger that says for things from Falco with that same rule, with, with the rule text terminal in shell, send it to this drop service, which is a Knative serving service. And the YAML for that is here. So a couple things to note, I'm asking for it to be uh, only cluster internal because I don't really want to expose the pod killing device to the internet, that'd be real bad. I'm gonna show you, uh, because of hard mode, co in action. So, so here we go, we're gonna deploy that. One thing I'll just add uh, as Scott is doing that is if you look under the template part of the services spec that is in the the top pane there on Scott's display, uh, you can see that this looks uh, pretty close to a pod, right, Scott? Wait, no, it doesn't look like a pod. It looks like a deployment. Uh, pods don't have the template. Deployment is what. A, right. Well, so I if mean, I, under if I the rearrange, template field, yeah. If I rearrange or if I change this to deployment and uh, you know the correct, and then added a bunch of other um, like a. Uh, Kubernetes service and some other stuff, then I would have the same setup. It just wouldn't scale to zero. It wouldn't have uh, auto TLS. Let's see, uh, so I can see that the I've got my drop thing. It's cluster local. It's ready to go. And so now let's go and, and exec back into that uh, fun SQL pod. And uh, we oh, so what happened here? So Falco detected that uh, somebody created this, uh, the terminal in shell. We got another event here, terminal in shell. If we refresh graph, we can see what the new graph looks like. So we still have uh, the Falco sidekick ingressing to the broker. We have another trigger for drop for this Knative service. So. Now we can see the event stream that's coming through the broker, but we can also cherry pick that the this terminal in shell and send it to the drop service, which goes and invokes uh, death onto my my interactive shell that I maybe am trying to do some malicious things. So I, I whipped this up super quick. It's not a ton of code. Um, I got to show you code, which is cool. Uh, any questions? Otherwise, we'll send it back. All right, thank you very much. I'm gonna share my screen again now. We'll just wrap the remaining slides of this deck up. There we go. Okay, will it blend? It blended, so that was good. Um, let's, let's talk about 2021 goals real quick. Um, as we're, we're running over and I thank everybody that's still watching. So number one, uh, my own personal opinion here is that we 
we have uh, the Knative APIs are at a V1 level and uh, V1 meaning, uh, you know, good expectation of backward compatibility. Uh, I think that uh, for, for me in my experience, the getting a project to a 1.0 level uh, is a very important psychological threshold uh, for adoption and you'll see adoptions also on this list. Uh, so for me personally, I'm hoping that in uh, in the first part of 2021 that we can uh, declare that Knative is 1.0. Um, we also, I think, are really interested uh, inside the community of folks that develops Knative and having more integrations. And the one that Scott has just showed us is a really great example of uh, the type of integration that I'd like to see. Uh, you know, the more things there are that spit out cloud events and can consume cloud events, um, the the more utility Knative is going to have for everybody. So uh, if we think about how do we make something that is most useful to everybody, um, the uh, the more integrations, the better. Uh, and Matt, I think you put the improve UX on here, so I'll let you speak to that. Yeah, sure. So uh, one of the things that we've started to do is um, uh, there have been a bunch of sort of user interviews where we've been talking to folks looking to get started with Knative and um, rumblings that we might start a, uh, a user experience working group to sort of look at, you know, uh, getting started as I think is one of the really important uh, sort of uh, journeys that a lot of users take and you know we want to look at a bunch of these and you know make sure it's as streamlined as possible so that um, you know we can we can get for folks from the point where you know they have you know a blank cluster and they're like hmm, I want to try out Knative and get them to that sort of aha moment like this is what Knative does okay um, as quickly as uh, and easily as possible. So that's that's what I meant by improve UX. Sorry, I just threw it on there. For <laughs> yeah, no problem. Uh, of course, we want more adoption. And I see there's a uh, I see there is a uh, question in the chat from uh, from somebody on YouTube. Uh, any update on how serverless is being adopted in the community these days? Uh, and I can I can speak you know from the numbers that we track uh, for OpenShift serverless, which is the the Red Hat product derived from uh, from Knative that we saw a pretty good adoption growth um, uh, in 2020. But uh, I, my own personal opinion, uh, it, and and this is why more adoption is on is on our 2021 goals here. I think that uh, in general, serverless is still a fairly advanced topic. And you know, if you think about the growth of the the Kubernetes community. Um, that kind of looks like a hockey stick, right? And and what that tells me is that uh, if we think about the uh, appetite for advanced topics, that probably there are still a lot of folks that are beginning their Kubernetes journeys right now. I expect the demand and adoption opportunities will grow. Uh, and it's, it's uh, you know, ad coming from the frame of mind of somebody who's uh, serving on steering and wants to help grow the project, uh, I think there's a lot more adoption out there to get us. Uh, so that's definitely something that I think that we'll work a lot on in the community. And we also really want to grow the pool of contributors. So I'll just take this opportunity uh, to say, you know, if you're if you're watching and you think that this project sounds interesting to you, um, and and it might be something that you uh, would be interested in spending your time on. Uh, however, uh, how, however much time you have to give, I will just say that like uh, I I think we have a really great uh, friendly community in Knative, and uh, we're also really interested in in growing the pool of contributors. So I would just say like um, if you have any thoughts about uh, like you know you want to contribute but you're not sure what you could do, uh, maybe you're not as focused on code. Uh, I will just say that, like, I think that there is something for everybody to contribute in open source, uh, and I'm I'm really interested. If you have the urge, if you have the interest, if you have the desire to contribute, uh, but you're not sure how you could do it, um, I I would love for you to to ping me and talk to me about it. Uh, you can hit me on on Twitter at Cheddar Mint, 
Uh, and you can also get me P-M-O-R-I-E at redhat.com. Uh, and I'd love to talk to you about how you could contribute. Um, we definitely could use your help. Uh, and it's a lot more, you know, when I think that uh, uh, probably in this audience, like there's maybe an unconscious bias toward thinking of like open source contribution as being all code. Uh, and that's just simply not the case. So if you can, if you can read documentation and tell us what did or didn't work for you from that documentation, that's contribution that would be very valuable for us. Um, uh, and, writing well, one, docs, one participating thing, what, in things. While you're going on, What's how that? about if you bop over to the landing page for Knative so people know where to find the whole project? Sure, it's, it's a very now. easy, it's a very easy URL to remember. It's knative.dev. Knative.dev, and that's a good jumping off point uh, to find any number of things, some of which are on this next slide here. Our GitHub organization is called the Knative Organization. Um, there's a link in this uh, in this slide that you can click when we share it, and I'll share it later on on, on Twitter and some of the other channels that you might be uh, uh, looking at for these things, so you can click that link. Um, but again, you'll find that uh, from knative.dev too. And I think someone else trying to talk, go ahead. Yeah, to join the Slack, it's uh, slack.knative.dev. That'll get you an invite code to come hang out with us. Yeah. Did I put the wrong URL on there? Uh, I believe that is the Slack workspace. The, o the other URL, slack.knative.dev, will get you an invite link. Um, you can also uh, you know, ping me on Kubernetes Slack. Matt Moore, no E, um, and I'm happy to share invite codes too um, if uh, folks need them. And I'll, I'll annotate yeah. this um, and correct that slide, um, and I'll upload the video to the um, OpenShift uh, Commons playlist shortly and tweet that out with the slide. So um, with that, I think we need to end and wrap up and respect everybody's time. And really thank you all for, for coming and all the work that you do in the Knative community. It's wonderful to see your faces. Um, I think each one of you probably could do an AMA on your individual topics. Um, so we probably will have you all back um, in the coming months. So um, thanks again. And um, for everyone who asked questions, thank you for participating. And we will be back again with another AMA next week um, on a topic to be decided still. So um, thanks, Paul, Matt, Scott, and thank Roland. You. Be safe, everybody, and take care. Thanks. Right. Thanks a lot for having us. Yeah. Have a great day, yeah. everybody. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.